This is all about getting away from the kind of half rep harsh reputation and the rigid reputation of law or the, the immutability of the blockchain, this kind of oppressive idea of these contracts and turning it more into an expressive creative language um, um, and getting rid of this bad reputation of kind of NFTs and DAOs and turning it into something which is more human-centered and controlled. I, I wrote some keywords and, and phrases from the kind of invite, the PDF you sent me. And the key phrase there is, uh, what is most valuable is the most vulnerable. Um, and um, a lot of the kind of the governance work that I've been interested in and have been doing, both in science and the arts, is taking really baby vulnerable ideas um, and um, kind of um, trying to release them in an open way uh, onto the open source community into a, a performance or into uh, a, the open knowledge ecosystem, a commons and what have you. And uh, what's kind of quite clear uh, in that, I've seen it with a number of my friends and, and projects, is that that kind of openness and that community out there, I mean, we kind of know it from Twitter, is a fairly kind of violent and dangerous place. Um, and um, uh, therefore, in the governance stuff, I, I, I talk about in the presentation going from an egg stage um, and incubating it through a caterpillar to a butterfly, this kind of open, beautiful structure that you want to create. And that duty, there's a duty of care there where, to begin with, you need to be very protective and you need to feel safe and you need to be able to play and experiment with quite sensitive values. And also, as an artist or an inventor, you need it protection because, you know, people do follow, copy, plagiarize, and often by kind of accident or laziness or because they've got a different ethos, um, uh, sometimes just, uh, you know, because they want to progress with their arts career or what have you. And um, as someone who wants to capture a, 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 a voice or a vision, in a way, you want to kind of release it when it's ready, when it's kind of been incubated from this egg-like stage. Okay, so um, I'm basically going to just introduce Lexon here. And the first thing to sort of talk about is see Lexon as a part of a, a kind of set, and even a historical set of what you might call performative languages or governance languages. These are languages um, that are very distinct distinct from descriptive languages, you know. So there's a lot of talk about technology being a tool and, you know, it's value neutral and what have you. And these languages aren't, aren't like that. They're performative in the sense that human values, motivations, incentives, kind of social psychology is embedded in the kind of DNA of the language itself. Um, um, and that comes, you know, you can allude to things like um, the, in the philosophy of language, performative speech utterances, and they have this kind of unique property of when you write them or when you speak them, something in the world is very likely to happen. So like a, a classic example of that would be a general giving an order or um, uh, um, uh, if you pay someone to do something, you know, to, you know, a thousand pounds to pick up this piece of litter, if you, if you, if you say that and in the right kind of governance context, and um, that act of speaking the language is very likely for that piece of litter to be picked up. And that also goes to legal uh, contracts and, um, uh, uh, financial agreements, which are a kind of subset of legal, they're, they're framed by governance. And the, f the kind of blockchain smart contracts and Lexon in particular are in this domain of performative contracts, um, of, of performative languages in, in which the act of actually writing these down, publishing and speaking to the has consequences in the world. So it's Lexon. Well, it's basically a, a language for human beings. It's a, it's a, it's a, trend. It's a language which um, uh, uh, we can read, we can understand, and also importantly, a, 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 a judge, um, 
a court of law can um, ascertain that the two parties that have agreed to this English text, and I'll put English in quotes there, um, have understood what they've agreed to. There's been a meeting of minds. And therefore, the code and the, the, the language become are the same thing. They're not kind of the same sort of language that, you know, so for instance, in terms of the history of human readable code, there's a whole history in, in the sort of science uh, in of languages which are literate languages. Uh, this is a kind of a, 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 an old dream. In fact, the first programming languages that were proposed by Leibniz and, and others where the application that they were thinking of, so this is in 1966, was to codify and formalize law. And what Lexon does basically is close this gap between kind of the program code, which is these zeros and ones or this obtuse formalization that programmers are, are familiar with, but humans generally without extensive training have no idea what it means, and the legal prose, so the two things become the same thing. And I want to distance this from smart contracts in blockchain for a little bit, because doing this process and writing down code in the way that Lexon, which I'm going to show you in a minute, um, enables you to do, um, one major benefit for it is to really clarify the legal concepts and enable you to do workshops with communities to express their values and the forms of agreements they want to do in their own native language um, and then structure it in a way which is clear and logical. And this you can almost view like creating a mobile app or creating another piece of code. You can do this, all the tool set of, of kind of programmers and human-centered design you can bring to this. And Lexon has an English, um, and I'm putting it in quotes because it's not just English. It can also be in German or French or Japanese or Urdu. There's a, any number of, and we've done experiments in, in several languages, they could compile down to this universal legal code, which then can also be uh, exported as a number of blockchain languages, or, or even just simple JavaScript to be used in your mobile app or your web application. So this is about creating a kind of universal open source legal language, which you do not just simply have to export as code that is in a machine. You can just print out the, the, clear, the clear text and use it in your legal constitution or even in your informal organization um, saying this is what we've agreed to. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to avoid here is this sort of this contractual confusion, this distance between these kind of noughts and ones. And Lexon basically replaces on the left there, you've got kind of solidity um, with uh, something that looks like this. Right. So this is Lexon code on the left. And I'll just show you a live demo of it um, in a second. So if we read what's on the, on the Lex, this is um, you give your piece of code. This is a small fragment of code. Um, uh, let's say it's an escrow contract, you know, a, a, a form of um, guaranteeing that a payment is made. And um, it reads, you know, sender is the creator of this contract, balance is an amount, receiver is a person, oracle is a person. And th these things are the definitions, um, and anyone can understand that. The, the meat of the logic in it are these two clauses. So it says you've got a payout clause and a payback clause. and it says the payout clause, provided the sender is asking for it, send balance to the receiver. And that's what the actual code looks like. So you get a kind of feel for what the, the language looks like. And like I said, it doesn't just have to be in English. We can also add and extend it to um, uh, other natural languages. So any language you like. Um, um, maybe it'll take about three months to, to, to formalize that because the vocabulary of the language is very small. It's only, you know, a handful, a, a couple of dozen um, um, grammatical terms. And I'll show you how that works later as well. Importantly, you can kind of extend this. So you can extend it with kind of oracles and you, you, the, the way that you extend the language is you kind of create your own concepts. So if you, the language doesn't, for instance, contain the term artist, but you can say things like artist is 
um, um, a, a disagreeable person. <laughs> and then you can say disagreeable is this. And all these terms like disagreeable, I don't know why I made that, <laughs> that example on the top of my head up there. But um, you can basically take uh, concepts and then start defining them uh, in terms of the very small grammar that Lexon uh, provides. And that way you really work with the concepts that you have yourselves and you create your own kind of um, um, a set of concepts that you work with in your governance. So what we have on the left here, this is in the web, an early version of the Lexon compiler. For instance, we don't need this comment at all, but that just gives us a kind of description of this. And we're here, we've just got a very simple uh, Lexon contract and we can compile down to solidity. So here's the solidity for this compiled. If we write uh, like a, another term here, let's say we want to add the, the payee here, um, we can see that the solidity changes here. And as we add more complexity, um, like for instance, uh, here we've got a couple of clauses. Oops, let's un undo that. Um, I'm just copying and pasting. But um, you can see that it compiles immediately on the right to solidity. Um, but look at the difference in readability. This is the artist pays an amount into escrow, appoints a pay, appoints an arbiter, and also fixes the fee. Okay, these concepts like fee, arbiter, payee um, are very financial, but we can also do them about whatever concepts we want here. Um, um, it's still really uh, um, skewed towards the formal decision making and allocation of resources type uh, um, uh, uh, concepts. But since we can use these other techniques of legal poems and, and informal structures talking to the DAOs, we can, we can uh, create this dialogue and this balance but in this evolving process between um, elements which we can spit out as very formal legal code or formal code. These are whatever we want. So, you know, we can basically say we're not dealing with artists here, we're dealing with performing artists. Okay, and um, the contract is the same. And by the way, this automatically um, uh, like generates, like, this will probably, because I now need to change like performing artist here into where it uh, occurs in the thing. So the performing artist pays an amount into escrow. And instead of the pay, let's call them jester. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, forms the jester and, and here's a library of example code if you like so and how this for instance um, forms um, a, a a form here immediately from the 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 contract so for instance if i take uh, this out you will see that the the kind of interface changes here you've now only got payee and payer but if I, I d define that now, you automatically should be able to generate the interface that you might want to run your DAO from. And so this process of sort of writing in an English language, seeing the interface and playing with it is how you can uh, uh, work with a community to define the, the contracts, okay? So this is what a, a, a richer Lexon contract looks like, right? So this is a, an oversimplicated <laughs> DAO, okay? This has been registered in Wyoming as an LLC. Um, this is, is the full contract that's running on the blockchain. Um, it, in fact, cost, I think, three times more to deploy it to Ethereum than it did to register the LLC, which was a bit annoying. But nowadays, obviously, that's not, 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 not the same. Um, so here um, is basically, you can write your own text, your preamble, this isn't, um, if you like, the legal part. Here's the meat of it. So you, you, you have your definition section. So you say, organizer is a person, trader is a person, a trading account is an account. And you usually have this kind of section here of definitions. Total capital is defined as the sum of crypto balance and trade capital, less capital offerings, things like this. And remember that this all compiles down to several blockchain languages, and it could be expressed in different um, natural languages, not just English, okay? Um, and then you've got this formal thing in law, which is called a recital. It's kind of the main logic of what you're doing. 
And this is for setting up the organizer. The organizer appoints the registered agent, appoints the manager, appoints all these people. And this is who the organizer is, a section about this, section about the manager, a section about how an election is conducted. On, on a Saturday, if no election is in progress, any member may appoint a manager candidate. And this, you can imagine these as hypertext links. You clicked on manager candidate and you go and see the, the definition of what a manager candidate is with a nice picture of the manager. And then you appoint someone and they fill it in and their face fills in on that interface, right? Um, and, you know, initiate the election process or on Monday, anyone may, in case there is a manager candidate and the proposal succeeds, appoint, blah, blah, blah. So you, again, you can see that even though it's a little bit formal and a little bit difficult to understand, you know, it's still so much easier than JavaScript or Solidity and for people to agree into it. And this ends up being basically about a five or six page contract. Uh, ending with things like here, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, payments, uh, how you make proposals, um, uh, and you can structure this how you want, you can reorder it, it's not flexible to the order. And so that's the sort of thing, the complexity you would do if you wanted to run a whole DAO, and I can tell you about what that DAO um, does. Um, and it's got an oracle in a way uh, in it as well. Um, so what we could also look at here is if we took um, the sphere contract here, you can see in a way how um, it's not so much work to take these terms and definitions, like what a seed performer is, an artist, these would be the definition sections, and turn these texts here, like net profits, you know, and uh, rights into Lexon code, which both would stand very similar to the way this is written as a legal contract, but also compiled down to something that you could run either on a DAO or in JavaScript or something like that. I want to talk about um, uh, basically this kind of more, more like the social process of the workshops and where Lexon fits into that uh, philosophically and practically. So um, here you can see a kind of cyclical agile process that we're working on in terms of the sorts of workshops that you can do with communities to develop the governance around the values that that community ho holds. So we can see kind of starting here on the, the kind of, up, uh, I think I'm pointing the wrong way here, up here on the uh, top left hand corner, it it might start with uh, a kind of creative provocation of some sort. It might be a live talk, uh, a, a game that you play, or a short video where you want to explore a particular governance concept. So for the, um, the sphere, we might take um, something like, you know, I know, what is the generative commons? And we produce a little kind of provocation in a video about that. And then you do your asynchronous kind of, you, you do your physical workshops, and it would be good if these workshops are facilitated in a decentralized way. So that various groups can contact and and sort of send um, uh, things. So I work on this kind of decentralized unconference format and then follow up with asynchronous discussions. This term here, metabolic cell, comes from actually legislative theater, Boal's theater practice, in which he used theater to and community um, workshops in Rio de Janeiro to create, I think, 15 or 16 pieces of legislation. And this is the sort of meat of how, where we would introduce Lexon. Because if you just try and bring laws, um, or you bring, uh, which is classic in the metabolic cell, so you get a kind of domain expert, a lawyer, and then a community to take the, the kind of performance and then explore how you would represent that in a legal way to create the kind of end result of the quote performance, which is a piece of legislation for legislative theater. In, in a Lexon uh, legal agreement workshop, um, that means that we can use the Lexon language and we can so kind of move from looser discussions to sort of like poetic short texts that capture the concepts. And then we can take those texts and express them in simple English sets of agreements that you can then discuss and understand, is that what we want? And those Lexon code can actually automatically generate interface elements and we can test them out. So um, this process of either spitting out as law or as code, reviewing it, and then maybe having another workshop where you, you've you created a, a provocation. You say, no, 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 that's not exactly what we want. We can do this kind of agile legal development process.
I created this thing called Liquid Democracy, which is a, a democratic process. And I did this kind of theatre performance uh, for the Turkish community here, which is this fake fictional um, a political party, which is called the Multicultural Yogurt Party in Stoke Newington Festival here, uh, with a, a, a Turkish artist called Dilek Winchester. And we had to create the kind of governance for this party. And um, we used Bawal workshops, theatre workshops, to work with the audience and prior to that with the different conflicting um, um, groups in our area from the Kurdish community to the kind of right wing Turkish to the left wing Turkish and the Armenian community and what have you. We did these workshops with the community around the values of yogurt and what multicultural yogurt might mean. And we used that to create the constitution for um, uh, the multicultural yogurt party. Um, and this was obviously, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years before blockchain, or b before Ethereum at least. And when Ethereum came on, it's that's kind of the, the smart contract concept was the idea of how we could take, because I was working in legal terms there. I was um, writing legal prose uh, within as an artwork for, for that project. So this is Augusta Boal here. This, by the way, is a, this is Augusta Boal. Um, And it's one of the branches of the Theatre of Oppressed. And Theatre of Oppressed is a very politically conscious form of theatre. This is Paolo Ferreri, a radical educationalist, and it was influenced by this. And it, it was the aim was to um, have a collaborative educational political process that used theatre techniques. Unlike traditional theatre, it enables the audience to stop the, the action and interact with the action to influence the direction of the performance. You can stop it at any time, it's like freeze framing, and anyone from the audience or an actor or um, um, uh, can stop the play. You then can rewind and then replay it again. Um, But while I actually got elected as mayor or verador for Rio de Janeiro in, in 1993 to 1997, and he ran this legislative workshops, I'm sorry, this foreign theatre workshops, but instead of putting on a perf theatre performance at the end, um, the, the result of the workshops was actual legislation which went to the city chamber and 13 new laws were passed. This included a law that all municipal hospitals must have doctors specializing in geriatric diseases and problems. More recently in Austria, um, in 2017, I think, a law was passed about the participation of disabled people in society. This slide here is really about um, a different technique, a community technique. So there's several techniques. If we go back to um, this kind of process of this provocation and the sort of workshops that we can do here, um, uh, this theatre practice, practice, legislative theatre, is, is one that basically, I think, frames the ability to do these human-centred theatrical embodied workshops and end up with code, legal code or blockchain code. But there are also other practices which influence, I think, this. One is um, in architecture, planning for real or uh, design charrettes, which I've, I've sort of worked on, where you do community workshops. Another in project cycle management, world development, where you do these kind of value mapping and you do this kind of project problem tree and you switch it to, uh, and it's very visual and graphing with post-it notes, very detailed situation where you design starting from values um, uh, the, the projects. You don't just start doing an idea comp or beauty contest around projects and say, which ones should we fund? You start to do uh, multi-stakeholder uh, workshops where you get the raw values out and you turn those values and then you figure out which ones you can do and which ones you can qualitatively assess um, and, and therefore track whether your governance along these values and the projects that you're doing actually is on track with the values that you started the project with. And this way of assessing quantitatively or qualitatively, more importantly, um, the values in your governance, there is expertise that comes from these sorts of more outside the art space um, in the governance.
this is a piece of, of software that we work with, which uh, comes from Dave Snowden's work, where you take narrative streams from stakeholders like blog posts or oral narratives, and then you use AI software to extract the concepts out of that in near real time, feed them back and map them out. And so that the, again, the storytelling values of the stakeholders creates a map that you can then bring into the governance again. And I'm just touching on these workshop um, uh, uh, um, modalities or methodologies, if you like, in a very um, uh, superficial way here. And I really would, would hope that we could go into it in a, a lot more be detail and bring in also the history of other workshop practice. And within this kind of legislative theater framework, design a clear methodology where you're really bringing in creativity and community practice, but you're also ending up with actual um, tangible uh, code, whether that is just legal sets of agreements or code that you can use in the running of your organization according to the values that the community have um, designed. Uh, a couple of slides here just on this kind of uh, evolutionary process, because it's such a confusing and unusual process for people. I mean, people might just about know about kind of some of these rather odd theatre practices or um, the architectural or how you engage people or um, participatory budgeting, but even that's super niche. And this kind of thing that we're talking about here is really kind of pretty unheard of. <laughs> so uh, we, we all feel confused and vulnerable and uncertain when we begin with. And this is this kind of, we have to start with enabling people just to speak and express their values. This is this kind of egg stage. And then we need to experiment a little bit and test it out um, with some actual structures and interfaces. This is the caterpillar phase. And in the end, we want to create this kind of really quite vibrant ecosystem of kind of decision-making bodies or organizations that really uh, enable us or empower us to have rich contest aware governance which isn't just you know these mega corporations or this voting once every four years or this kind of practice which you can't use your design art creativity and expressivity of your values in a regular uh, uh, way to to influence the way things are happening and these images come from things like sociocracy and also the sustainable development goals where you can imagine decision spaces for each of these sustainable development goals and how you might do your uh, a governance circle around that, that using these techniques and yet all these things need to come together in this kind of ecosystem of values so the complexity of the final governance that we're aiming for this butterfly is 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 really complicated and it's very daunting when you start but you want to start with something really really simple a really simple workshop and a really simple you've straight away got your kind of decision making governance sort of little atom that you can now play with and experiment with and that's where Lexon can help us create these kind of um, DAOs around like NFTs or ideas, intellectual property, um, expressing the values in a really clear way, which we can take to in to more and more formal structures we don't even need them to be legal we can just create them as a, a little kind of informal community uh, website and we can create it as a, a completely radical DAO or we can um, add the um, we can use the text as uh, our legal constitution as well and then we can get these DAOs cooperating with each other and, and talk about that but this is this kind of transition where you are basically have a, a kind of sunset clause for each stage you say th for this stage we're just going to use this telegram group and we're going to use voting like this or and we're going to make these agreements or we're going to use this voluntary association we now need something a bit more formal with a bank account and we're going to use a kind of traditional legal structure here and this is this minimal viable governance stuff that i work on and in the end we want a whole ecosystem of these cooperating with each other and that whole community developed design process is what we're talking about here um, this is uh, uh, the legal structure that I tend to work with, or an earlier version of it, with kind of the top being the vision or the purpose or the guardians or the keepers of purpose. This here being um, kind of the research, the creative uh, part that actually is now 
two parts, the kind of just the creative part and the research part, the R&D part. And this is the kind of team of doers and makers. And this is kind of the ner nervous system or the platform that connects them. And so you can see a legal or an entity with three or four clear structures, each of which has its own kind of feel, taste and way of working and is governed by its own um, sort of terms of practice or only ethos. I think it's kind of also interesting to ask yourself, what would be a kind of creative language? What would be um, a, an arts or a performance language that you would um, create um, that captures the kind of values and the logic of performance artists that we could use to kind of compile down to our legal agreements? And, you know, that could be a kind of LARP-like playful language, like some of these computer languages, you know, that, that sort of, you know, cling on or what have you, a, a kind of tongue in cheek. But we could really do quite an interesting, a creative language around creative values that compiles down to agreements here and uh, give that open source to people uh, all around the world to organize their live performances or their creative projects. This is my, this is an artist that works with calligraphy, Islamic calligraphy, that's amazing that um, I'd really like to involve in this project in which the because if you, if you, um, the amount of detail and the richness in terms of um, uh, um, Arabic and calligraphy and how the, the language is formed around these legal concepts is, and, and how you can represent that in geometrical shapes and like artworks so that your actual contract becomes a painting is like really interesting direction to go into in terms of what form a sphere like contract could be. This is, again, I'm looking at a kind of sphere with this kind of energy and all these ideas inside it. There's this process of, of formalization of these, these geo geometries, which are like discursive geometries. These, each one of these nodes can be a meeting. Each one of these ways of looking at it, a perspective on a particular topic. And so you can do several workshops in several communities and put them in this kind of um, object, this, this IP around the object. And then you can have meetings that uh, uh, explore this shape in a kind of way. And there's a formal way of doing that which comes from some history, which is called syntegration, for instance. And when you use 20 kind of meetings um, with, 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 with um, uh, no, up to 20 people and 12 meetings where they meet and you, you, you have these groups of five and it's quite a formal kind of meeting methodology that you can use. And uh, this kind of idea of capturing the community discussions and the agreements through that kind of process of a workshop is also interesting. Um, this is all about getting away from the kind of half rep harsh reputation and the rigid reputation of law or the, the immutability of the blockchain, this kind of oppressive idea of these contracts and turning it more into an expressive creative language um, um, and getting rid of this bad reputation of kind of NFTs and DAOs and turning it into something which is more human centered and controlled show you uh, briefly here for instance is this is kind of my home living room at the moment and like um i've got um uh you know my kitchen here and i've got kind of this green wall here um that i paint that i can use for green screens and i've got uh, the, the camera view is just sticking out of here and i've got the ability to use this green paper on the table and kind of do these workshops in this space if you like and what i would really like to do is to be able to facilitate workshops with a network of these kind of home studios in which we can take live footage out in nature or in the environment or in a theater and we can have a kind of it's it's kind of decentralized um conference is, is what I would call the, the format where we have groups meeting physically together and then these studios can mix these together so that we have breakouts and the, the videos are 
almost immediately or the audio recorded from the group work is immediately put into that kind of sphere, that little discussion part as a kind of like interactive visual that you can then explore. So, and you'll be able to go back and say that particular discussion when I had a breakout with Lenny, um, that, that is in that place there. And I now want to discuss this. And in fact, I want to form a little circle around that, maybe a little DAO around that. And um, we're going to explore the value of vulnerability in in the sphere and then you elaborate those values and you go through that workshop and then you bring that back this way of facilitating the workshops using you know um you know bringing these kind of of uh, videos and things in is like uh, what I really want to work on and I, I've got it set up so that as I change I mean got a little mixer here as I change that it automatically cuts the video into small pieces because it's really annoying when you get this very long video you know and then you have to go to point hour and five minutes in this video to look this thing up you want these little provocations which are very small and then you want to be able to elaborate them and that is kind of part of the governance workshop where you take a discussion like this with uh, instead of it being Lenny and Eric in um, Portugal there's a little group working there and they go off and they workshop and they scribble on the board and then they come back and they record their summary of what they talked about and that goes in one of these spheres and you know and I guess you're in Berlin is that am I right there Yes. Yeah, so you do a little workshop there and I do one in London and we bring these together and we elaborate this kind of map and I didn't talk about that. This kind of map, which you can see as a sort of mind map or as a sort of decision making structure, this basically is a prototype, like a blueprint of um, a, a decision making structure um, in in. Cass Sunstein sort of is a legal philosopher I really like. He talks about choice architecture as a map which empowers people to not imposing them on you have to go left or right, you have to do this, that and the other. But it gives them a map which increases their freedom because they now have a sense of where they could go or where, what the consequences of where they're going. So we can build these decision making spaces. And part of it is the workshop format. That's the facilitation and the methods. Part of it is this kind of um, the, the way that the technology or the recording and the writing process can archive these, uh, these conversations in these spheres or these little spherical objects or these little geometrical shapes. And eventually this kind of butterfly governance structure emerges from that. I can kind of often like do a little bit of a spiel and people get inspired and then they leave the room and they go, what the fuck is, was that? I, I can't remember. You know, it's like, um, and, and, and so what I really feel is needed, and that's why the kind of theatre and the arts practice is so much, is to create a really embodied, simple experience when you walk into the space you under you feel this connection and you feel how it works you don't have to read loads of text you don't have to get very theoretical about the politics or the blockchain or the technology you just experience it and um i i another thing i think you need is a sort of motivation that makes you believe you can go to that future and so just doing it in a theoretical way and say oh maybe i'll turn up but that's why i'm really excited by doing a kind of net network performance in the context of the sphere because i think it's such a compelling opportunity to get circus theater magicians street performers live art performers across europe doing these kind of little community workshops or a big thing networking that with this facilitated set of sort of decentralized media production and governing that performance right as a, a kind of lexon dao which captures the values of that community and given that it's a, a network performance we can market it we can get the finance for it to a greater degree than we can do with a simple one-off or even a touring performance because that sort of thing hasn't been done before we can also run it in quite an improvised workshoppy way we still need to do do the how it's synthesized and show it uh, well and i would love to um evolve a network performance 
uh, with the community um, and put it on at the end of the kind of four year period at the end of 2023. And that gives people a kind of target where they can say, oh, I'll work on this bit of the performance. I will create this live interactive debate with this community. So yeah, um, and, and the magic of uh, here and the, the jester role of, uh, of creating this and, and people feeling and sensing the future they could co-create together, capturing that in a network performance and making sure that we resource that well with media and production um, and, and empower people to do what they want in this kind of network collaboration. I think it's a super, super, it's like a dream of mine to realize that kind of performance. And with all the work that the Sphere has done, I know it's difficult to pull it off and finance and all these things, and um, but I would really like to see that as a goal that motivates the process. And then you do these workshops and these kind of legal agreement workshops. You can see it as a, a process to get the, the governance of the DAO of the sphere together, which is okay, but quite honestly, there's probably about even in an arts community that are interested in DAOs, it's probably one in 50 people who are going to be seriously interested in that. You know, they want to do performances, they want to do other stuff, right? So um, the, combining the idea of these workshops where the performance is the performance of the voice of the DAO, how the DAO speaks. Yeah. And, and, and so anyone, the community or an artist can ask this governance structure a question like, you know, should I get paid more? <laughs> or <laughs> like, um, 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 you know, the values of vulnerability, um, what do you think of that? And then you ask the DAO and now the DAO that does this kind of performative thing and the the, the com comes back with this collage of performance and and performs the response to it you know maybe it's in two days time maybe it's in in 15 minutes time and and when the DAO has a voice that you can speak to and interact you combine the motivation of the artist to improvise and to perform with an audience right with some of these augmented technological structures and then you really open up the motivation of people mm -hmm. and then you also also give the audience the ability to experience that governance. Yeah. I, I also think there's a sort of design stage before the kind of formal legal language, which is a bit like a haiku poem, which is like, it's like pseudo code. Um, on the far right of so the most formal, you've got this kind of legal, the, the code that is very um, explicit and what it does, right? In between, you've got this text, this kind of legal prose, which might be a bit ambiguous and ambivalent and up to interpretation. And in the far left, you've got a kind of embodied assembly of uh, performative uh, interactions where you can really capture things that you can't formalize very easily. And when you have a dialogue between those three components, um, then you can really do the performative aspect. And could the, could the fact that that code exists address the generative idea of the sphere? I, I, I definitely believe so. So one, I think, embodied in this process is, I mean, I see it as a cycle where the performance is like your annual general meeting of the, the, the distributed uh, governance, where all the audience is a member and the performers is a member, and they kind of, through interacting with the performers, decide on what the governance for next year would be. And so they shut down the previous governance, and now they adopt a new set of themes and decision-making process. And you can almost aesthetically judge the success of the governance by the quality of the, the, the social interaction and the artwork that's performed. And so um, you have this evolving generative process going on precisely because you're using workshop formats and the way that you're coding the, the agreements in a way that allows this quite agile community driven process or what have you. So the idea of creating a living document, something that is continually alive. So I think these le legal agreements by embodying this kind of creative practice and this art practice and the way that we use m media um, and the, w I mean, the, the structures that I, I sketched out here, like the minimal viable governance, they're influenced by things like uh, complexity theory or uh, viable systems theory, which is all about studying nature and looking at the minimal structures that feed back to each other to keep the thing sort of responding to the environment and moving forwards. So it's all about thinking, how do we keep this damn constitution that we do um, 
exciting so that people want to and enjoy. In fact, I, I believe we can transform your kind of governance meetings of your housing association or your volunteer or your community association into a sort of theatre practice where people would pay to go to because it's so exciting. And we can create these constitutions as living documents. The, the process of doing that really bring it to life. Um, and in a way, the technology can take the boring templates and the robustness and the decision making and just put it into the background so you just take it for granted you just walk into this space you discuss you go home and then the decision happens and all the administration is taken away from you and the transparency and the legality and the financing it's all in the background now and we use art and paint to steer our way through what what we believe in and what we value rather than all this formal process we do have to be careful and to look at slow decision making and not have everything change in a crazy kind of way um, because this often is in, our, in the Spheres case performing artists careers and the livelihood that we're talking about so that's by the way something I do want to avoid because I've done a lot of this experimentation in art space in the 90s I love the way you can just use bits of paper like and suddenly you start oh, yeah, to yeah, get yeah. these videos and things <laughs> and uh, uh, I, how you can paint and draw and combine the layers and then you can make that interactive and bring them in and you can send stuff and we can put them together i'm just dying to realize that and i i'm a hacker so i'm not a, 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 a performer i'm not an artist i'm not a video artist i'm not a musician so i can't realize the beauty of what I know that we can do by combining these sort of physical objects or elements.